I mean, I think BibVM is is the key thing. You know, I, w- I was writing some internal notes for my team recently about like what I care about, and I think BibVM enables optimistic rollups on Bitcoin uh, under the you know caveat the security assumptions are at least one validator in the set or a sequencer, whatever you, you, you want to call them, has to be honest. Plus, miners have to not censor the fraud proofs. Um, the first, both of those caveats, I think, are fine. Uh, but this is another conflict of visions. Bitcoiners mm-hmm. tend to lionize the perfect at the expense of the good. And I think Ethereans are the opposite. They will iterate faster and pursue merely very good things and not try for perfect things. And um, a lot of Bitcoiners get lost in these conversations because they look at um, that assumption that miners aren't going to create a cartel of whatever, 51% of hash rate and start censoring. And they think, well, it's not perfect. But that's fine with me. I know it's, I'd I'd be, I find it very far-fetched that miners would decide to censor fraud proofs if there was an optimistic roll-up. Like, first of all, it would be very hard to get that many miners together. If a pool started misbehaving, people people could immediately defect to a different pool. And miners are structurally long Bitcoin anyway, so why would they want to harm Bitcoin? I always found that incredibly far-fetched that people consider that a show-stopping objection. So my understanding is that, you know, BitVM could be out as early as mid-year, and I know that there's a lot of optimistic rollups that are being built at the moment, being funded and being built uh, with the intention of rolling out in 2024. And I think that changes things a lot, including from the investor perspective, like the Wall Street finance people, the like Main Street allocator types that are buying the ETF. I don't think we can coast on the ETF like excitement forever. Like these people care about the technology they don't maybe care enough to like dig into like how Bitcoin core works or whatever, but they do when they're making their allocative decisions care about the vibrancy of the network. And if it's a total ghost town that nobody uses, I think they'd be concerned about it. They'd be like, okay, am I just buying like a pet rock type thing? Like, can I really justify this? So I think you always do have to show even if it's simply just for optics reasons, you do have to show technological development and like a positive vision of the future and a way in which this thing could become a dominant sort of transaction method and a network that people actually use. Um, So I think the technology and the sort of like financialization of Bitcoin are intertwined and you can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as we move into this like intermediate term with ETF flows and things like that, these allocators will continue to ask themselves, like, is there interesting stuff happening on Bitcoin? Why Bitcoin as opposed to any other blockchain? And just being the only blockchain with an ETF or any, you know, the only crypto asset with an ETF, I don't think is sufficient. So we do have to continue to show that there's like actual technological developments happening. Isn't the internal, expressive, endogenous side of Bitcoin kind of like the spiritual successor of the big blocker spirit? Well, I was uh, a small blocker, and I believed in in that approach. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe. I think the big blockers were wrong in that they felt that merely by adding block space would be sufficient to get Bitcoin to be adopted as a payments network. Like, that was always the argument they made. Like, okay, how are we going to onboard millions of people in the global south if the blocks are one megabyte or whatever? Now they're four megabytes. I don't think that was true because I don't think the block size was the constraint right. at all. The constraint there is, like, is there interesting stuff to do with it? Um, you know, and I always felt... And also the other constraint is, like, people don't really want to use Bitcoin to transact with for, like tax drag reasons and like because people would rather transact with dollars right that's another thing the bitcoin community has been really slow on the uptake about which is stable coins so i think they were wrong for other reasons um and i see like the notion of other l2s like roll-ups i think that those are actually consistent with like even the lightning philosophy mm-hmm. which is um execute computation off-chain 
and then periodically sort of batch state and register it on chain. Like, I think that's the best way to do scaling, right? And I think Ethereum has that in common with Bitcoin, frankly. And like the Solana vision, the monolithic vision is the competitive vision. So I tend to think that rollups and like other types of sidechains and L2s are still consistent with like the dominant philosophy within Bitcoin. But it's going to take a lot of convincing to get the sort of like lightning crowd to sort of agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I kind of think the, the reason why I asked this question is like the big blockers, uh, I agree, were like wrong in their implementation, but not necessarily wrong in spirit. Um, and this is actually kind of like my overall critique of Bitcoin as a system. And like when we opened up this conversation, I was like, oh, yeah, Bitcoin ideology, spot on. But like Bitcoin, the blockchain as a product, as an execution, incorrect. And Ethereum is correct. This is like my like high level view of the of this of the system. Uh, and but like block small blockers, I've always thought like have the right ideology, the right design for how you build a base layer. But then the big blockers are what you want to build on top of that. Uh, and so the big blocker philosophy to me is just like we can do more with our block space. We can do more with our Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. uh, and the small blocker philosophy is like we need to preserve base BTC transfers peer to peer at all costs, including the costs of like being able to do more with our Bitcoins. Um, but then, of course, we have like innovators and, you know, innovations and progress where we can we can have both and we just have to figure out how to get there and so right now like the the small blockers won like we had this we have the small block size on on bitcoin but the big big blocker spirit is now returning with bitcoin expressivity bit vm layer twos on bitcoin ordinals using bitcoin for data uh, and now we are seeing like um a harmony and alignment between these two philosophies that's kind of creating some sort of like greater than the sum of his parts, which is like all you can see when you see like statefulness, vitality, vibrancy, like you've said, uh, VC investment, content production coming around to Bitcoin. And all of a sudden, like this is kind of what you get when you align people's incentives, align people's ideologies, and you can make them both work inside of the same constraints, which is just Bitcoin. That's like kind of my like landscape definition here. Yeah, and I would say like I, I do perceive that as well. And I think the fundamental disconnect is between people that pursue layered scaling as the model and want side chains and you know L twos and things like that, and between people think that you can just sort of arbitrarily increase the data throughput, mm -hmm. um, and that's like the monolithic versus modular right. uh, debate, I guess. Although mm -hmm. Bitcoiners wouldn't call it that, and uh, from that perspective, I think Bitcoin and Ethereum are on the one camp. And then like Solana and Aptos, et cetera, are, are in the other one. Uh, but yeah, it just took Bitcoin a lot longer to realize that there should be more than one scaling solution. Like mm. the, the comparison I draw would be like the sort of intellectual rot and stagnation that occurred in Bitcoin would be like if Ethereum was still trying to do Raiden. <laughs> like if it was just Raiden. Or the like, percentage of listeners that know what Raiden is. <laughs> It's like below 1%. Raiden was basically Lightning Network on really? Ethereum. Yeah. <laughs> you, you have such little faith in Bankless Nation. <laughs> so, we so have just like, like never talked about Raiden on the podcast before. <laughs> okay, okay. I didn't know that was such a deep cut reference it was a, there, That was a deep cut, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, but think about that. Like if all of right. ETH core dev in the year of our Lord 2024 mm -hmm. was still focused on Raiden or... Right. For another, ex like Plasma, maybe, for instance, mm -hmm. Plasma Cash. Plasma's probably right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, you just have to iterate. And, like, even leaving all the details aside, obviously a system that is adaptive beats a non-adaptive system. Like, that's obviously true. Like, you can't be completely static in a world that changes. Bitcoin has endeavored to be static for five to seven years now. Clearly, we need to be empirically driven look at data, evaluate whether things we're doing are working, and change accordingly. But we haven't. We've been so stubborn. We've been very, um, like, a priori driven, like, non-empirical. And that's, like, my main critique of Bitcoiners is they actually reject empiricism a lot of the time. They reject data because uh, they view a lot of this data or these observations as, like, immoral things to say. 
like stable coin is another side of that debate. Like for years now, I've been saying, hey, stable coins have traction. In 2020, I wrote a paper called Crypto Dollars, and I said, wow, stable coins are doing 30% of all value settled on blockchains, and that's growing linearly. I refreshed that last year in 23, it's now 70, 80%. Mm. All value settled on blockchains is 70, 80% of that is stable coins. And so on that basis, I said, Bitcoin is losing the medium of exchange war, right? Which is true. It's a true fact, right? Bitcoin has actually been displaced as sort of the crypto native collateral. It's not the thing people use to collateralize on exchanges anymore. It's not the medium of exchange. It's certainly lost unit of account battle. Right, you don't uh, quote your positions in units of Bitcoin the way you used to, right? And I went and I said this to the Bitcoin community. I said, "Stable coins are winning. What's our stable coin strategy? Like, stable coins are the killer app of crypto. Is Bitcoin going to benefit from this, or is Bitcoin usage going to be cannibalized by stable coins?" And Bitcoiners said to me, "They said, well, actually, you need to extend your time horizon. Like, this data is irrelevant. Ignore the data because uh, you know, decades from now." Uh, people will not use the dollar, they'll use Bitcoin to transact with. And I said, well, I don't care about decades from now. You know, forgive me, but I care about today. I care about years from now. I don't care about some idealized uh, future state that you think will happen, but is very indeterminate, uh, in which uh, dollars don't exist anymore, and everyone has to use Bitcoin because dollars have, uh, you know, gone they've like exploded or whatever, hyperinflated. So like that's another conflict of visions, which is like I'm data driven. I have to be, it's my job. Like we allocate for a living. We have to look at where, you know, the puck is going. We have to be data, like reality driven, but there's a lot of resistance to that in Bitcoin, which is the same resistance to lightning. Like, if you, it, you know, lightning is a very telling example. Like the lightning, throughput like there's a big debate on bitcoin twitter about lightning right now and the lightning throughput is like at most one to two billion dollars a year in terms of value settled right and you could say oh well you know it's a lot of individual transactions like it's you know useful for like social media and content monetization applications which is true but the fact is it's probably one to two billion and bitcoiners will say oh you're excluding private channels that's fine but that's not like orders of magnitude more than what's measurable Stable coins, you probably know this. Stable coins in 22 settled around $10 trillion worth of value. Mm-hmm. That's roughly the same as Visa. And they're probably going to do the same in 24. It was a little bit down in 23. $10 trillion versus $1 billion is 10,000 times more. 10,000 times more. So, like, how can you not look at that and think to yourself, maybe like we missed a trick here? Like maybe we need to figure out how to harmonize and synergize Bitcoin and stable coins. Like what's the strategy? But there's a, a, a general refusal and a rejection of that type of reasoning because stable coins are like immoral or wrong or bad or whatever. I will say though, some Bitcoiners are now coming around to the notion of stables and like there's attempts to like bring them onto Bitcoin in various ways. To continue leveling up your crypto game, then you need to get on the Bankless newsletter. It's the world's most popular crypto email and it's completely free. Just click below to sign up.